Welcome to Sunday worship here at the Lincoln Place Presbyterian Church in the 31st Ward of the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're here via the magic of YouTube again today with a service that we're recording on Wednesday afternoon in the sanctuary of the church. So welcome everybody. We're, we're here every Sunday at least through the end of July. We're not, that's as far as we've planned our Sunday services out. And so we thank you for, for joining with, with us today. Let us begin our service with a prayer. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit to us, gracious Lord, be with us today as we gather in your place and we welcome you to us and all that are with us this day. Move through us, guide us, bless us, have mercy on us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we gather before the Lord, let us join in our confession. The proof of God's amazing love is this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare with confidence to approach God. 
Let us ask God to forgive us. Let us pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We have gone along with evil, with prejudice, warfare, and greed. God, our Father, help us to face up to ourselves, so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us each take a silent moment to make our own peace and our own confession to the Lord. We are wrapped in the love and mercy of the Lord. Hear now the great good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. A reading from the book of Psalms, Psalms 69, verses 7 through 18. O Lord, I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children, for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Don't let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Don't let the floodwaters engulf me, or the depths swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Don't hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. The word of the Lord. Good morning from North Carolina. Today's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. We are reading from the message. The baby grew and was weaned. Abraham threw a big party on the day Isaac was weaned. One day, Sarah saw the son that Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham, poking fun at her son Isaac. She told Abraham, get rid of this slave woman and her son. No child of this slave is going to share inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter gave great pain to Abraham. After all, Ishmael was his son. But God spoke to Abraham, Don't feel badly about the boy and your maid. Do whatever Sarah tells you. Your descendants will come through Isaac. Regarding your maid's son, be assured that I'll also develop a great nation from him. He's your son, too. Abraham got up early the next morning got some food together and a canteen of water for Hagar, put them on her back, and sent her away with the child. She wandered off into the desert of Beersheba, where the water was gone. She left the child under a shrub and went off, 50 yards or so. She said, I can't watch my son die. As she sat, she broke into sobs. Meanwhile, God heard the boy crying. The angel of God called from heaven to Hagar. What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy and knows the fix he's in. Up now. Go get the boy. Hold him tight. I'm going to make of him a great nation. Just then, God opened her eyes. She looked. She saw a well of water. She went to it and filled her canteen and gave the boy a long, cool drink. God was on the boy's side as he grew up. He lived out in the desert and became a skilled archer. He lived in the Paran wilderness, and his mother got him a wife from Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. 
The Gospel reading today is from the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning with the 24th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of, this, of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring, bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today's scripture from Genesis tells the story about an act of great cruelty committed by two pillars of our faith, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. We heard about them in the sermon that Pastor Josh preached here last week. Abraham and Sarah were greatly blessed. In their old age, they had a son, Isaac, and Isaac, later called Israel, grew up to become the father to Joseph and his brothers, who themselves were the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, 13 years earlier, before Abraham and Sarah had this family, the childless Sarah sent her slave girl, Hagar, to her husband. In a society where men had multiple wives, this was not shocking, but it was big trouble. Hagar and Sarah had quarreled when Hagar was pregnant and Sarah was jealous of her. At that time, Hagar ran away into the desert, only to be rescued by an angel of the Lord who promised that Hagar's son Ishmael would grow up to be the father of a nation and a great multitude of descendants. Now, years later in today's passage, Sarah sees Ishmael playing with Isaac, and she goes crazy, concerned that the firstborn is Ishmael and not Isaac will be her husband's heir. She demands that Hagar and Ishmael be sent away out into the desert where they're sure to die of thirst unless they starve first. Well, there's a lot going on in this story, but from the time of a few weeks ago that I saw that it was coming up in the lectionary, on a Sunday I was going to preach, I knew where I had to go with it, into a sermon about how people we follow and admire and lift up can do terrible things, as Abraham and Sarah did a cruel, terrible thing, just because they could, just because the lives of Hagar and Ishmael didn't really matter to them and the people around them. 
even though Hagar and Ishmael were precious to the Lord who rescued them, and who not incidentally also rescued Abraham and Sarah from themselves. This is a story of grace and blessing about God's love for us all, the wronged and the people who wronged them, and all the other people who are standing there on the sidelines. And so this is a, this is a sermon about racism and about intolerance, about our, fav- our failure to love our neighbors as ourselves, as Jesus commanded us to do. And this is a sermon about God's love and mercy. So I wrote a sermon on Sunday and Monday. I woke up Monday and I I didn't like it. And I wrote another sermon that night and finished it on Tuesday. Pretty much an entirely different sermon. And I woke up this morning, I'm speaking, I'm recording this on Wednesday afternoon. I woke up this morning and I thought that I was just going to fiddle with it a little, you know, polish some language, move some things here or there. And I didn't do that. I decided it was time to to stop working on this sermon and start listening. In the news early this morning, I heard this, I heard, I read about a pastor named Leon McRae in Virginia. And I listened, instead of working on the sermon, I listened to his service two weeks ago today, on June 7th, from the Lighthouse Church in Woodstock, Virginia. It's on YouTube. It's on the same medium that I'm speaking to you through today, and I encourage you to to listen to it. His name is it's Dr. Leon K. McCray, M C C R A Y, at the Lighthouse Church. And this is the story that he tells. He is Dr. McCray is according to the news story, 61 years old. He spent 24 years, according to his sermon in the in the Air Force, has been a pastor in this church for about 10 years. And a few weeks ago, he was at a rental property that he owns near his home in rural Virginia. Woodstock and Edinburgh, Virginia are pretty much due south of here, maybe 150 miles in the Shenandoah County, which is up against the West Virginia border. Very rural, rural area. He was visiting his rental property. He saw two people dumping a refrigerator into his dumpster. And this has been a lot of, a lot of trash dumped in his rental property before. And so he went up to them and he told them to quit. And that's where, that's when things started. They were, he is African American, they are white. They were defiant, they were insulting and worse. It was a man and a woman, one of them went away and brought back three more people. And before long, this man, this peaceful, calm man, was surrounded by five people he did not know. One ahead of him, one in front of him, one behind him, the others at the side of him. They started started pushing. They insulted him with the, the worst racial epithets that they could muster. And so what he did was he 
he pulled his gun on them. We had a concealed weapon permit. He pulled the gun and he dialed 911. He called the police. And before long, this crowd of six had swelled to a crowd of about 16. There were a number of patrol cars, sheriff's deputies, local police. He thinks there were about 10 law enforcement people who were there. They did not ask him what happened. They asked the white people what happened. And in the end, they arrested Dr. McCray, and only Dr. McCray on a charge of brandishing a weapon. This man who had never been in trouble, never been arrested, had until this moment never been handcuffed, never had a spotless record, a man of God, a man of the church, was carried off in the patrol car and booked. Well, this has, I would say, not a happy ending, but a good ending. He kept his composure. He did not, he did not fight them. He did not insult them according to anything that I can, that he said or that I have heard. And he explains all this in his sermon. But there it was, a scene that he describes as the, the most humiliating moment of his whole life. He says that this was, that he felt afterwards like he was lynched, just not killed. And it's had, as I said, it's had, a, it's had an okay ending the charges were dropped. You'll hear in the sermon that he's still talking about where he's going to find a lawyer to defend himself about the, against the charges against him. Those charges have been dropped. The other five people, ages 26 to 57, three men and two women, are facing a variety of charges, including felony abduction, assault slash hate crime, assault by mob, assault and battery, and trespassing. Now, as we well know, this could have turned out a lot differently. By the grace of God, he is safe today and able to tell about it. We also know that there have been many other situations that did turn out differently. And I'm not even talking about the, the recent, well-known well incidents captured on, on YouTube, on, on cell phone, which most of you have probably seen on the news. I'm talking about the things that happened in backcountry America and suburbs and cities and every other place. Dangerous situations that have been going on for a very long time that we don't hear about at all. Sometimes because the only people who would tell us about them would be the victims and the victims aren't around anymore to talk about it. And so it is by God's grace, I believe, that we are, we are at a moment in time where we are being asked to do things differently than we have traditionally done them. It's hard for me to preach about racism. It's probably harder for me to preach about it than it is for you to to listen to it, and it's a topic that we find difficult to discuss in the church. Martin Luther King Jr. famously pointed out that 11 o'clock on Sunday 
is the most segregated hour in America. And things haven't really changed much in that regard in the past 50 years. And out of sight means out of mind. White people, by and large, are reluctant to talk about race anywhere, including church, or maybe especially church. When the audience is mostly white, we don't discuss it. We have, we have been at a place in this country where a lot of white Americans have thought that the problem of race has been settled and that the evidence that they cite is a straight line of achievements from the past 65 or 70 years from Jackie Robinson to the school desegregation to the Voting Rights Act to the campaigns of Dr. King to the election and re-election of Barack Obama as President of the United States. That told a lot of people that, that racism was over, that we had already dealt with that, that it was time to, it was time to move on. Well, the, the very public history of the last month, the last three or four years especially, has told us that that is a, that is a mistake. And here's the mistake that white Americans have made and continue to make. It was thinking that racism is simply a matter of what's in each person's heart or what's on each person's tongue. A white person who, refers for, who refrains from telling nasty jokes and using the N-word has no stake in racism, this argument runs. And anyone who says otherwise is just being un un hysterical and unfair and nasty. This is the position taken up today by elected officials and, and the guy down the block. In Pittsburgh, we even have a newspaper editor who claims to know a racist when he sees one and to be one, according to what he's written, you pretty much need a KKK robe and a hood in your closet. Well, what's, what's wrong with that position? What's wrong with believing the racial climate is far better today than it was 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago? Well, first and foremost, it ignores yet again the the witness and the words of African Americans who know what it is to be ignored, denigrated, even killed over nothing. The witness of, of people like Dr. McCray, who can lead spotless lives, blessed lives, and whenever, at any given moment, run into aggressive racists, African Americans know that the problem has not been settled by a long shot. It used to be that black teenagers had to endure the talk about dangers of the outside world, told by their parents and grandparents and elders, and now it's the preteens that are having to hear it. The assumption that white Americans have too often made is that racism is just something that African Americans have to deal with, and only African Americans. If you live in a mostly white community and go to a mostly white church and send your kids to a mostly white school and have a mostly white circle of friends, well, it's not your problem. What's, what's wrong with saying it's not your problem? Well, 
Here, here it is. When white people slip into the trap of regarding streets and stores and schools and parks and places that are built just for themselves, for people just like themselves, then people of color enter those spaces at their own peril. And we have today's situation where the issue is what's being called synthetic systemic racism, where the danger comes not from the, the ill will of individual people, not what's in individual people's heart, but from the long process by, we, by which we built this society, leaving room for people of color only in certain places at certain times. And yes, people, people are angry. You can watch the news any night and see how people are angry. They're angry at the end, at the, this stage of the pandemic, that African Americans basically have the, the same risk of getting sick and dying as white people who are 10 years older than they are. And this can be linked to risk factors like heart disease and diabetes. But during the pandemic, we also see that many of the riskiest jobs, prison guards, healthcare workers, nursing home aides, meat packers, are disproportionately held by black and brown people. And so here we are. Like Abraham and Sarah, we think of ourselves as, as God's people. God announced that in the Hebrew Testament, telling his followers, I will be your God and you will be my people. And Jesus in the New Testament extended the definition from Jews to everyone who bends a knee and declares that Jesus is Lord the elect, the loved, the ones loved by God. But at every turn of the Bible, in every turn of our history, we have been doing something like what Abraham and Sarah did, protecting our own purity and privilege by saying this one or that one is not one of us. And so what happens to them is not our problem. And like them, we have a merciful and forgiving God who delivered Hagar and her son from the desert and who promises us redemption when we confess our sin. So we need to listen more. All of us need to listen more to one another. Listen to those voices of the, the African-American church, like Dr. Dr. Leon McRae. He has a sermon that he ends with the story of, of Queen Esther. Like so many in the black church, he loves the those Old Testament stories about people enduring, people putting up with a whole lot and still remaining on their feet. He says in his sermon, I am a king, I am a kingdom son. I know God will turn this thing around. I find his faithfulness and his hope inspiring. Follow Jesus. 
We need to remember that racism made Jesus furious. Read the stories of the Good Samaritan, the woman at the well, the Roman centurion, the Syrophoenician woman. All of them remind us how Jesus built his kingdom to take us all in, brothers and sisters together. So don't just say something, don't just think something, don't congratulate yourself. Know that we are in a hard and dangerous time. Pray hard that we will be freed from this terrible thing, this terrible stain, this lethal racism that threatens us, threatens us all. Amen. So let us pray together the Apostles' Creed, one of the creeds of our church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
So let us pray. Lord, you are our good shepherd. You are the one who is taking care of us. You are the one who keeps us safe on a dark night and guides us through a bright afternoon. You are the one who gathers us all together and puts other people in our lives. The traffic during the pandemic has been less than it usually is. Most of us see fewer strangers than, than we did. But that itself, Lord, can be a, a dangerous time for people who are living by themselves on lonely streets and lonely country roads. Keep them safe, Lord, be with them. Be with all those in need. Be with the millions who have lost jobs and are hoping to get those jobs back or something like it. Be with all those who are hoping to get out of their houses, to see loved ones, to see nieces and nephews and grandbabies that they haven't been able to travel to see or who haven't been able to travel to them. Be with all those who are sick, all those who are in the hospital, all those who are in the dangerous places we know as the nursing homes. Be with all those who are in the very dangerous places, the prisons and the jails. Be with them. Bring daily bread to the homeless. Bring care to the poor. Bring yourself to all of us, because we are all in need of you, Lord. We pray this in the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in tem into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. close with a prayer that I found on YouTube, which is a great source for us this week. I found it on a Salvation Army website. Uh, it's Martin Luther King's Prayer for the Church. And on the Salvation Army website, you can see you can, the words flash along with background video from the civil rights movement and I was really I was taken by it I don't have the video but here are the words let us pray Lord we thank you for your church founded upon your word that challenge us, challenges us to do more than sing and pray but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, 
sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common bond of humanity in the reign of our Lord and of our God, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious upon you and bring you peace and protect you. Stay safe. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.